It's Monday, July 1. In the headlines, Jamaicans urged to prepare for Hurricane Beryl. In business news, JBDC's Business Beyond Town initiative. Regionally, Antigua and Barbuda confirmed as host of the Organization of American States General Assembly in 2025. And in sports, Jamaica failed in its final attempt to qualify for the men's 4x400 meters in the Olympic Games. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Jamaicans are being advised to prepare for the impending weather condition due to the passage of Hurricane Beryl. The Ministry of Health and Wellness in a statement explained that persons with chronic illnesses such as diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease and asthma are reminded to have adequate supply of medication and if they have to evacuate their homes, they must ensure that they take their medications with them to their place of shelter. All pregnant women who are within one month of their delivery date should relocate to family or friends who are in close proximity to a hospital or delivery center. The ministry says public hospitals will remain open. Meanwhile, the center of Hurricane Beryl will be across the southeastern and central Caribbean Sea late today through to Wednesday when the hurricane nears Jamaica. That's a word from the Meteorological Service of Jamaica. Beryl is a Category 4 hurricane on the Sapphire Simpson hurricane wind scale. Fluctuations in strength are likely during the next day or so, but Beryl is expected to remain an extremely dangerous major hurricane as its core moves through the Windward Islands into the Eastern Caribbean. Some weakening is expected in the Central Caribbean by midweek. However, Beryl is forecast to remain a hurricane. Hurricane force winds extend outward up to 55 kilometers, that's 35 miles from the center, and tropical storm force winds extend outward up to 205 kilometers, that's 125 miles. All small craft operators, including fishers from the Keys and Banks, should be arriving in port to start preparations for safe harbor. The Meteorological Service continues to monitor the progress of Hurricane Beryl and all interests are encouraged to pay special attention to further releases. The National 2024 Youth Summer Employment Program is set to give 10,000 young people the opportunity to be gainfully employed. The participants, aged 17 to 29, are to be paid $60,000 over their four weeks of employment, which commences in the second week of July. Prime Minister Andrew Holness, in his address during the launch, emphasized the importance of the participants developing a strong work ethic. Who are uncomfortable, dissatisfied with the job that they currently have, such that they don't do it well, and therefore they never get recommended for the job that they want. So as youngsters going into summer employment, I want you to take this bit of advice. Whatever you are tasked to do, do it to the best of your ability. Do it well. Notable among the program's features this year is a focus on addressing homelessness, which will see participants assigned to the poor relief department across the country undertaking surveys to assess the size of Jamaica's homeless population. The total number of summer jobs to be created by the government is expected to exceed 20,000. Local government minister Desmond McKenzie urged this year's participants to treat the program with the same seriousness as they would their future careers. Technology will play an important role in what you do this year. We are going to be training you to use certain systems that we have in the Ministry of Local Government to identify the expanding road networks across the country. 
every aspect of local government will be covered this year under the program. The Prime Minister and Local Government Minister were speaking at William Nib Memorial High School in Trelawney on the weekend. The Education Transformation and Oversight Committee, ETOC, is reporting that all 129 short-term measures being implemented by the Ministry of Education to improve the education sector are on track. ETOC Chairman Dr. Adrian Stokes provided the update at the committee's quarterly press conference on Friday. Danita Rodney has the details. Speaking during the Ministry of Education and Youth ETOC press conference on Friday morning, Dr. Stokes said the committee started 35 new initiatives in addition to the 95 that commenced last year. Of the 365 recommendations from the Patterson Report, work has begun on 129 initiatives. 94 initiatives from the previous year and 35 from the current period. The overall progress on the transformation plan is 15%, a two percentage points increase over the prior reporting period. I am happy to report as well that all of the 129 initiatives being worked on are on track. This is a credible performance by the ministry, and I would like to acknowledge this strong showing for the current reporting period. At the quarterly briefing in March, Dr. Stokes had reported that four initiatives he described as low-hanging fruits were lagging. On Friday, he reported that they were on track. It is important to note that the four initiatives that we reported as lagging at our last briefing are now on track. The NEI reports are now publicly available and the ministry is now publishing financial information on schools that are funded from the public purse. In addition, the implementation of EMIS or the Education Management Information System is moving forward. Importantly, more resources are being channeled to the early childhood level in line with one of our key priorities for this transformation project, which is to fundamentally transform our early childhood sector. The ETOG chairman sought to assure the public that the data being reported on regarding the committee's progress can be trusted. There's a very well-developed project management framework in place around the current transformation exercise. Very important framework to monitor and track the implementation of the initiatives. Importantly, the project management system that is being used to manage a project, software called Asana, provides, importantly, an audit trail that improves governance and integrity. This goes to the heart of the project management process ensuring there is data integrity that serves as a foundation for accurate and timely reporting. For the news on PBCJ, I am Danita Rodney. Time now for the business report with Denise Williams. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us on The Business Report. I'm Denise Williams, your guide through the latest happenings in the world of business. The Jamaica Business Development Corporation, JBDC, said it has connected with 600 new clients since launching its Business Beyond Town initiative in May this year. According to the JBDC, the initiative aims to connect face-to-face with entrepreneurs in rural areas to inform them about the corporation's locations and range of services provided for small businesses. The JBDC has established business centers located in the parishes of Kingston and St. Andrew, St. Thomas, Manchester, St. Anne, St. James, and Westmoreland. These business centers are strategically located to serve neighboring parishes which do not yet have a physical space. Social entrepreneurs 
see their aim in social problems decreasing and improving the level of the life of the society or a target group. Social stock exchanges serve as a mediator between social enterprises that need funding and investors who are willing to invest their money. For investors, social stock exchanges make the procedure of social enterprise investment simpler, increase the transparency of social projects, help to save time and cost of project searching, provide immediate liquidity, reduce financial and administrative costs, and provide objective information about social projects. We sat down with Nora Blake, manager of the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange, to understand more about how the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange is seeking to align with that reality. Now we're here with Miss Nora Blake, head of Jamaica Social Stock Exchange. Actually the manager, the right? Manager. The manager yes, of Jamaica yes. Social Stock Exchange. And again, we're talking about something very new yes. in the you know, in the mindset of investors which instead of getting cash yes. in your hand when you donate and you invest socially, yes. you get a social return return mm -hmm. on investment yes and i know that many of us have friends and family that need support mm -hmm. and if it wasn't for established institutions they wouldn't get the, yes. the support and that's a good place to start mm -hmm. for us because what we saw happening in jamaica is that there are so many noble um, persons and institutions doing good work. Right, right. But because the social sector is a part of our MSME sector, yes, they share the same number one problem. Mm, and what is that? Lack of access to financing. Ah. Re re consistent. Right. Sustainable financing. Yes. And so the social stock exchange is set up to help to alleviate that particular problem ah. in terms of mobilizing resources yes. for the sector. Yes. And that's interesting because a lot of times when we're dealing with charities, mm -hmm. we talk about what touches our heart. Yes. So I love to see a child get assistance to go back to school mm -hmm. or a community get a new road mm -hmm. or, you know, an organization get a, a van mm -hmm. to drive people around. Yeah. But what you're saying is something that I think when people are thinking about giving to charity, I think the word you've used that actually could I really want people to consider it is sustainable giving. Sustainable Tell giving. Tell me about that. I mean, because give me three reasons why <coughs> sustainable giving is important. Just three. Well, I think the historic fact remains that many have started and they've had to stop. Uh -huh. It's as simple as that. Okay. Because you just don't know where your funding is going to come from. Another thing that happens in the social sector a lot is that people start out with a particular mission and there are sources of funding that are outside of their scope and then they try to squeeze into that and they move away from mission. Okay, and so, so you have an incomplete right. mission for so an entity. And the third? And then the third thing is that um, I believe sustainable financing should go hand in hand with accountability mm -hmm. and transparency. Right. So as we seek to facilitate trust sustainability in the sector, we are guaranteeing, we are ensuring that people have accountability for their funds. Wow. So when we look at all the good work that's happened over the many, many decades and such, the big challenge, the unspoken challenge yes. that the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange is seeking to address is, is sustainable, sustainable financing for, so the when, social sector. for the social sector. So for persons who visit the website, they will be able to see on the social stock now exchange. Now we're getting to the meat right. of the matter. So Yes, right. because so, once you visit, yes. you can make a difference. Yes. You, you can determine that m I can decide which area I want to make an input right. so that we can get the Jamaica that we all want to see. All right. And so thank you so much, Nora, manager of Jamaica Social so, Stock Exchange. 
We're talking about sustainable giving. We're encouraging everyone to visit the website. JSSEJA.com. Thank you. Thank you. During trading for the 30-day period of June 1, 2024 to June 28, 2024, the following companies represent the top three most active stocks that investors bought and sold on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Alternative Energy Provider Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with 66,353,463 units amounted to 11.99% of the market volume in terms of sales. Toll Road Operator Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with 60,624,560 units amounted to 10.96% of the market volume in terms of sales. PVC Manufacturing Omni Industries Limited with 47,918,544 units, amounting to 8.66% of the market volume in terms of sales. Over on the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, trading on June 28, 2024, registered a volume of 257,573 shares, crossing the floor of the exchange valued at 2,612,786 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and 16 cents. Massey Holdings Limited was the volume leader with 121,434 shares changing hands with a value of 400 88,164 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and 68 cents, followed by First Caribbean International Bank Limited with a volume of 53,350 shares being traded for 368,136 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and 68 cents. Moving from the money moves of investors, executives and companies, we turn to the Forex market on June 28, 2024, the Bank of Jamaica reported that U.S. $70.8 million was bought from Forex traders, while U.S. $72.8 million was sold to Forex traders. Buying directly from the Bank of Jamaica, foreign currency traders sold the U.S. dollar for $156.31 and bought the U.S. dollar for $154.96. The difference between the buy and sell rate was $1.35, which represents a profit for forex traders for every US dollar traded. Canadian forex traders earned a trading profit of $1.84 from transactions with the Bank of Jamaica. The Canadian dollar was sold at $115.48 and bought for $113.64. For traders looking at the British pound, they pocketed a profit of $8.12, selling it for $202.20 and buying it for $194.08. For the credit report tip of the day, as an entrepreneur, understand the distinction between personal and business credit is crucial for the growth and sustainability of your business. The first step in separating business credit from personal credit is to establish your business as a distinct legal entity. This could be a limited liability company or a corporation or another structure that best suits your business needs. This formal separation ensures that your business finances are not tied to your personal assets and credit score. And with that, we wrap up today's business report. I'm Denise Williams, appreciate your company. Stay well informed, stay ahead of the curve, until our next update, take care. In regional news, Antigua and Barbuda has been confirmed as the host of next year's General Assembly of the Organization of American States. The resolution, unanimously adopted during the ongoing 54th session of the OAS General Assembly in Paraguay, is anticipated to be significantly beneficial to the country's economy and elevate its international profile. Philana Johnson reports. The moment when regular session of the OAS General Assembly adopted a resolution by acclamation for Antigua and Barbuda to host next year's OAS General Assembly. 
It's another achievement worthy of the history books and comes on the back of this country's successful hosting of the fourth conference on small island developing states last month. Antigua and Barbuda's permanent representative to the OAS, Sir Ronald Sanders, made the presentation to a packed plenary room. On behalf of the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Garston Brown, and the people of Antigua and Barbuda, I am delighted to extend a warm and heartfelt invitation to host the 55th regular session of the General Assembly of this Organization of American States in the allure of our islands Antigua and Barbuda in June of next year. Sir Ronald explains the huge significance for the country in hosting this hemispheric grouping. It has been 22 years since the OS General Assembly graced the Caribbean. And we believe it is time to bring this gathering back to our region. We invite you to experience Antigua and Barbuda, not just as a venue, but as a home where the spirit of unity and the joy of collaboration are part of the very air that we breathe. Sir Ronald used this video to provide a foretaste to the audience of the country's stunning natural beauty. He noted the country will provide a unique backdrop for the 55th regular session. To host the 55th regular session of the General Assembly is to celebrate our shared aspirations and achievements in a setting that, as you can see, provides not only for productive discussions, but also unforgettable experiences. This will be the second year in a row that the country will be hosting a major international gathering. It will also be a time when the winter tourist season is winding down, therefore presenting an opportunity for increased economic activity, especially for tourism stakeholders. Falana Johnson, ABS News. At a reception in Georgetown on Thursday, commemorating the 248th anniversary of U.S. independence, President Dr. Ifran Ali and United States Ambassador to Guyana, Nicole Thurite, lauded the robust relationship between their nations, with a particular emphasis on security. The ambassador reaffirmed the U.S.'s unwavering support for Guyana in times of adversity. More from Newsroom from Kurt Campbell. Both President Irfan Ali and U.S. Ambassador Nicole Terrio are sure that the security partnership and collaboration between Guyana and the United States of America is currently at its strongest as the two sides seek to build on the decades-old bilateral relationship. Ambassador Terrio said the U.S. regarded Guyana as a friend that it intends to keep close. Her comments countered only by Dr. Ali's reassurance that the U.S. was indeed a great friend to Guyana. She said the U.S., even with its imperfections, will always stand on the side of what is right. And we keep our friends close. In the face of bullies and tyrants, the United States will always stand on Guyana. We will continue to grow... and prosper together and enjoy peace and security in this critically important region. There was little variation to those sentiments when Dr. Ali delivered his remarks at the July 4 celebrations. Both stayed clear of directly mentioning the border controversy between Guyana and Venezuela. Uh, the can be different. There is no conversation between the U.S. and Guyana in our security architecture that seeks to fuel any uh, act of aggression or anything in this region. Every single conversation in this relationship is about keeping this region safe and peaceful and keeping the people of this region in an environment in which they enjoy the rule of law. 
Meanwhile, addressing the specifics of the security partnership, Ambassador Terrio said both the military and law enforcement level, the relationship between Guyana and the United States is at its strongest. Guyana has hosted recent trade wins exercises, bringing over 1,000 partner nations personnel for exercises promoting regional stability, along with complex military-to-military -military engagements. Dr. Ali thanked Ambassador Terrio for her support and input in strengthening the relationship. 